So you start putting together this little piece after piece after piece after piece, and before you know it, not overnight, but over time, you become successful. Well, one day is Thursday, August 22nd, 2024. This is the week. Dead charts. I just want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules. All right, what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, as usual, I'll have a lot to say about that, especially given the nature of this market. Your favorite stock and crypto picks, if you don't mind, just hold off till we get to the live charts. So for the methodology in action, I want to update you on a longer term trend position that we've been in through thick and thin. And that's kind of kind of cool. I know I'm a nerd, but it's pretty awesome. But then I want to do a brief TFN 10% update. Now, I want to take a break from my Million Little Things series, and we'll pick that up maybe the next week. And I received a, a question, and I came up with eight steps to solve that and most other trading or many other trading problems and that all makes sense i'll flesh that out in just one second and of course if you have any questions feel free to punch them in now there's the flame screen as you know you can lose money trading or as i'll summon up all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff now between now and then that's from my buddy my buddy greg morris so there's all my contact information if you need to reach me davelander.com contact i do answer all emails eventually <laughs> But feel free to hit me up on any of these platforms. I do have a Facebook group. You have to be a member of DaveLandry.com. You have to be a gold member at least to participate there. All right, let's talk about the mystery charts and the methodology in action. There's the open spreadsheet. We just have one stock left open. We'll talk about that in one second. We have two potential shorts going into tomorrow. And those have been on there for a little while. So we'll take a look at all that. So here's, um, let's see what happened to ULS. Okay, so here's a potential short. You can see made a bit of a triple top in here. Now, I don't trade directly off of bigger picture technical analysis. However, it is useful and it can sort of provide a little bit of a backstop for you or backing, however you want to look at it. It kind of help you out a little bit when you have these major tops in place followed by a bow tie, a first thrust, or in this case, a little bit of both. So you can see sharp sell off, and so far it's retraced higher, and so far it has a trigger. Entries here, stop if triggered would be up here, and your initial profit target is down here. This stock looks like it's in a lot of trouble. It looks like a major tops in place, but hey, you don't receive one day at a time. One or two more big up days, or one or updates in general, and this will likely come off. So right now it's at a bit of an inflection point. It's trying to get back to its old highs. But look at all this overhead supply that it has to get through. So even if it did, if it did trigger, I think we'd have a hard time. Even if it did rally back with all that overhead supply there. So interesting stuff. Here's the other setup going into tomorrow. You can see kind of a double top or rounded top or cup and handle top, whatever you want to call it. Also, what's interesting is it formed a bow tie to the downside. Now this is a fairly clean bow tie. Notice that the moving averages came together fairly tightly and spread out quickly. There's only, it looks like just one bar of yellow down here. Now, your best bow ties are coming off of all-time highs or major, major highs, multi-year highs, or major lows. I, I'm not as excited about a bow tie somewhere in the middle of a trend where market might sell off a little bit and then bow tie back to the upside, like we could have in that previous mystery chart I just showed soon, or even in this one, if it keeps on going higher. But I do like the fact that it went from uptrend proper order, 10 greater than 20, 20 greater than 30. These are exponential moving averages, except for the 10, which is simple. So 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential. I know my longer term peeps are rolling their eyes, but <laughs> if I don't say what they are, I'm going to get emails. Uh, so I have to do that. Anyway, after the bow tie, your one bar pullback will be right here, but notice that the stock kept pulling back. Entry's here, stop is here, and the initial profit target is here. My ultimate goal with this transitional type of pattern would be to catch a major, major top. I'm not picking a top because it looks like the market is already top. It looks like it's uh, it's sold off fairly hard and could be in a lot of trouble. All right, so those are two mystery charts. Here's our uh, existing long. It's kind of cut off down here, but I'll show you in the actual chart. So this down below is a screen capture from what I call my model account. It's where I've mimicked the trades 
as exactly as possible to the service. Now, I say exactly as possible. There might be cases like last week or two weeks ago where I played a whole bunch of options and I ended up rolling those options and rolling out and, and adding to the position on roll downs and it worked out nicely, knock on wood, except for the last couple of options that expired worthless. But by that time I was so far into money, it, it, it was, I could live with it, right? And that's what trading is, making decisions and living with them, right? So sold half of this position at the IPT and this IPT is actually a little bit lower than what I have here. I think when I updated the chart, it went up a little higher. So the IPT I think is down here somewhere. We were looking for, what were we looking for that? About four points or so. And we sold half and then the mark to market based on a little while ago, it actually closed a little bit stronger than this, but the mark to market of the remaining 200 shares was 26.72. And that's about a $600, point, $600, point, uh, $600 swing, which would be about 0.6% or exactly 0.6% in the model account so that's a that's a decent swing knock on wood now as you know the market has had a lot of ups and downs since we put this thing on way back in june okay and knock on wood this position has done fairly well so you want to see each position to its fruition good bad or indifferent as i've said before in for a penny and for a pound all right Brief update on TFM 10% system. So the zones again, or this would be the top of the green would be 100% of the 50 week closing high. So right here, that's a 50 week closing high. Notice that zone doesn't go higher until we make a new closing high, okay? Or 50 weeks where that, that high begins to drop. And that's why back here, these zones were dropping because we were in this bit of a longer term type of spill coming into 2023. And then obviously that all changed and we started, the market started making brand new 50 week highs. Anyway, the sell would be way down here. And you can see it just dipped into the 5% zone. So this is less than 5% away from the 50 week closing high. The top of this would be 5%. The bottom of this would be 10%. And so when you're down here, again, my chart got messed up, but this 10% is down below this line here, down in this hot pink zone down here. Anyway, there's the cells, and you can find more information on YouTube slash Dave Landry if you want more information on this. But that was the last sell down here. And then the buy was, and again, everything's off. My apologies. I didn't realize, my apologies. I didn't realize it updated. But the one bar one would be here, low greater than the moving average, and bar two would be here, the low greater than the moving average. So the buy would have been right here. Buy is just simply within 10% of the 50 week closing high and two bars of Landry Light. And that's just the whipsaw filter to keep you from going in and out too much. So that's that. Now the NASDAQ, I went long 100 shares at 319.49, just kind of as a, an S and G type of trade, just to see what happened. So if stopped out, the stop would be at 424.40 which is quite the drawdown. You can see that it came dangerously close to that level. Now, keep in mind that this is a mechanical system. And when I developed it, I didn't think through a lot of things like the calendar week versus a rolling week. So it is a calendar week, would have to close below the 10% line and 10% from the 50 week closing. Now it's very simple, but it gets, it gets tricky when you try to talk about it, right? But anyway, I just recently went through an $8,000 drawdown, and that's only on 100 shares of the queue, so that's substantial. And that kind of gives you a little bit of a proof of concept without getting into it too deeply. Longer term trend following, as I preach, your drawdowns are abysmal, your accuracy is also abysmal, but it's where the real money is. And I have sort of solved for that best, I think, that can be it can be solved for through my hybrid money management, which I'll walk you through in just one second as part of the Q&A. But anyway, that's a that's a steep drawdown, and that's something that I'm gonna to touch upon in a minute, is is the drawdown to open profits, which can be, can be painful, obviously. All right, I had this banner ad on my site, and I'd kind of forgotten it was there. Initially, I put this up when I started the members area, 
and you would get an automated email once you submit a problem telling you that in the next q a webinar i would take care hopefully take care of that problem or i'll give you some solutions for the problem some uh, plausible solutions anyway what happened since is i had started the facebook group and that all but eliminated the need for a q a session I'm not opposed to doing sessions, but if you guys have questions, you ask it. And uh, most of you guys in the group are kind enough and smart enough to be able to, by the time I get around to answer the question, they've already answered it for me because they know the methodology, which is very flattering and exciting. But anyway, uh, I recently found some questions, and there was one in particular uh, from this banner ad, and I need to adjust that so future questions will be covered in the week of charts which this is the week of charts now just in case you watch a recording of this unless i did a quick clip but the quick clips come from the week of charts for what it's worth i trade with the trend but most often i take profits way too quick and leave a lot of money on the table then I wait for a pullback to buy in again only to watch the stock go down almost to my stop i only use mental stops usually, then rebound, go up, and after a few dollars, take the profit. It seems like I feel anxious about staying with the market, especially more so lately. Well, lately is an exception. Lately has been pretty bumpy, and that's that's one of the things that you're just going to have to get your reps in, and I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes, but part of those reps is living through a variety of conditions good conditions where you're printing money bad conditions where you have short reversals choppy conditions where you can't find a setup to save your life and then something in between i think it was brian gelber i believe that once said three months out of year you're so hot you can't sleep at night because you're so hot three months out of the year you're so cold and you wonder whether you ever make money again and then the other six months you're making a little uh, lose a little make a little lose a little and just grind it out that that pretty much sums it up now, in answering this gentleman, I said, the fix is not hard. It's not easy, but it's far from hard. First, you have to want to fix the problem and be willing to do what has to be done. And in this case, this gentleman's name is Bernie. It sounds like he is. And I just kind of threw this in there because I find it kind of interesting. I've had people email me literally for over two decades. There's at least two people in particular still email me to this day. Uh, although I've become a little bit more tough love in more recent times because both of these individuals have wasted 20 years of their lives trying to learn how to trade when all they had to do, I know, easier said than done, but all they had to do is do the simple things that I'm going to talk about tonight or go back to go back 20 years ago and do what I said back then. And I'm pretty sure I said, be selective, trade one pattern till you become successful trade at small size, and a few of the other things that we talk about right now. Now, the number one thing that I told this gentleman was, if you can't follow the plan, get smaller until you can. So you want to trade at a small enough size to where it's small enough to where it doesn't stress you out. And if you still can't follow the plan, you want to get smaller even still. And you have to reach a point where you're trading at a size that is nearly meaningless. I've, I've known a couple of people who have been sort of part of the industry, but kind of more on the periphery, and, and if that's the right word, and not necessarily traders. And they, they're they exposed to a lot of traders and a lot of traders' education. And in both cases that, that come to mind, both of these gentlemen did fairly well early on and in one case, I, I said, I'm very, I'm very impressed. Usually people don't do this well this quickly. And he says, well, hang on, Dave. I am just, I'm trading at such a tiny size. It's, it's barely, it's nearly ridiculous. And then that made sense. So he's able to get the reps in, get the psychology down, place the orders, and so on and so forth. Now, again, trading is about getting the reps in. And if you're not following the plan because you're stressed out, you're not getting the reps in. You need to hold a position like that ULS I just showed and just ride out all those bumps. I mean, take props along the way, of course, and trail that stop higher, but then just let that position go day after day after day. 
doesn't happen often, but every now and then we'll be in a position that we've established months and sometimes years ago and we have longer term trends. I've seen this before written out and it, it's just not, it's not directly to trading, but it does apply. A bad plan followed well is better than a good plan ignored. Now, obviously you don't wanna keep following a bad plan, okay? But you, you still wanna work towards better planning, don't get me wrong, but you have to reach a point where you could actually follow a plan. Now, I'm not a huge fan of mechanical trading, but maybe when you're getting getting started, maybe do a little bit of mechanical trading and just follow the system to a T, good, bad, and indifferent. Now, of course, you need to be selective. And I think this was number 77,310, if memory serves, of the million little things was just take only F, yeah, trades. So if you're feeling F, yeah, and you should know that feeling if you've been trading for a while. You should see a setup and your pulse should quicken a little bit. You should get excited. Maybe you're, you, uh, you know, you just can't wait to put the trade on. Now, of course, as I beat the dead horse on, and this comes from Ed Sakota, you have to be careful with intuition versus intuition. But if you've been doing this for a while, and believe me, that's one thing that I recommend you do, obviously, is your due diligence, okay? Find one little simple setup, something like, let's say, Landry Light pullbacks to the 30 EMA. Study those, find 100 examples, find 30 of those 100 that fail miserably, find 30 that did okay, and then find 30 that did fantastic, and then find another 10 while you're at it. <laughs> Some of the math will add up. But you definitely want to reach a point where you see a setup and you're excited about it. And of course, if it fails miserably, then you do your postmortem and you say, okay, was everything there to begin with or was this a setup mirage? And that's something that I've, that's, I'm working on too. It's like you, you have a, everything so clearly in hindsight, but there is a foresight in that hindsight a lot of times. It's kind of like you take a trade. And you're like, ah, I probably should have taken this trade. It's like all of a sudden you see everything clearly. And I'm not talking about when you're stopped out, like suit, like five minutes after you get in, then you're like, oh, wait a minute. The, the trend wasn't that great. It wasn't a, it wasn't an awesome setup and, and all these other things. Now, if you're feeling kind of meh, don't take the trade. So, and this is the tough part. It's that forced intuition or that intuition, like I just said, from Ed Sakota. You got to be really cognizant of that. When I'm in a zone and when I'm on fire, I'm on fire. It's amazing. But sometimes I try to force that to happen, especially like I'm doing something intraday. Now, with the, with the longer term trading, I'm a little bit more calm and I'm able to ride it out. And, and believe me, having clients has really helped me do that because I put out a plan for them, which is the same plan that I'm going to follow. And that tends to work over time fairly well now you know in any ind individual trade it could be an independent outcome and who knows whether it's gonna work or not but i know going into a trade if i recommend it especially in more recent times maybe over the last five years or so i'm trying to get the best of the best setups out there to a point where a lot of times i will recommend any setups and i'll lose clients because a lot of times clients are looking for action they're not looking to make money and learn how to trade now I'm not the grand poobah, but if you want to see what I think is an FES setup, like I said, especially more recent times over the last five years or so, where I feel like I'm becoming more and more selective and maybe my stock selection has become a little better and I've learned that less is more, but go in and look at the archives, daily.com slash archives. And we'll go, with, we'll go through a few of the, I think it was three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I went through like the last five or six trades that closed out. So you can go back in and watch those week, watch that week of charts. But when you're looking at these setups, you should see some combination of persistency, acceleration, ability for the stock to trade cleanly, uh, pullback, if you're trading a pullback in and of itself, that's deep enough, but not too, too extreme, and all these things that are preach. And you probably want to think three times before putting capital into harm's way. I forget the Latin for it, prenum non cheri or something like that. Uh, first, do no harm. So take the doctor's creed. You want to first do no harm to your account. 
Now, unless you have the mother of all setups, like sometimes I'll see a setup, it's F, yeah. And maybe the setup's not trending fantastic or fantastically, I guess is what I should say. Maybe the market trend is really not there, but I really, really, really like the setup. Well, when you see a setup that you really like, take it, okay? And you kind of have to weigh, is your, is your regret, is your fail, the failed miserably test I talk about quite often. I think that was one of the million little things. So ask yourself, if this trade failed miserably, could you live with yourself, okay? And if the answer is no, then maybe you shouldn't take the trade. But ideally, not just an FES setup, but an FES setup where the sector's backing you and the overall market is backing you. And if you look at those two shorts I have recommended, if you look at the representative sectors, they've begun to roll over and looks like at the least they're topping out and could be in trouble. Now, by having the market behind you and the sector behind you, it does put a little wind in your sails. And sometimes that in and of itself, uh, let's say if it's 1999, even if you got a little sloppy and you're stock picking, stock picking, if the market is just going straight up, then you'll likely do pretty good anyway. Now, again, go look at my archives because it's free and it's a great exercise if you're willing to do it. And and study success and failure. So everything is there, warts and all. And, and believe me, there's a, there's a lot of ugly trades in here too. And there's occasional big, huge winner, which makes it all worthwhile. And a couple of uh, grinding it out where you hit the IPT to scratch out. So I'm going to go through these fairly quickly because we talked about them a few weeks ago. But in this case, this stock was in a strong uptrend, had a nice deep pullback. And those are all the parameters as far as the entry, the stop, and the initial profit target. Now, what I liked about this setup was it was an accelerating trend. In fact, it was kind of like a third gear, one, two, three. And I think there's something there. I've never really fleshed it out fully. But the accelerating momentum strategy, you just need a market to be in an uptrend and then have that uptrend take off. And then you look to play the first correction. But also, if you notice, the persistency was there in this particular stock. And that means it tends to go up day after day after day. In fact, I had watched the stock go up day after day after day. And... I was thinking, of course, oh, I wish I was in that stock because it's going up every day. But because it didn't fit my methodology, except for maybe a momentum list, which I'll touch upon in one second, there was no reason for me to buy it. And I had to wait for a setup. And when it finally set up, I felt like this trade would, would work. In fact, I would be more shocked if it didn't work than if it did. And I tell you, it did, it did give me a, a run for my money. It scared me quite a bit. And by the way, in this particular case, we were able to get out. The opening was. Uh, had exceeded the IPT, so that made the exit a little bit better. Here's another one. This was an IPO. This trend pivot pullback. Entry was here. Stop was down here, and the IPT was up here. And this was a hot IPO. First deeper trace, but trend pivot pullback. And let's see. We'll come back to that one in one second. This was K and F. Uh, another IPO. Nice deeper trace, but. It took off, kind of went straight up, and then it just had a nice orderly correction on the way down. SVM, another one, trend acceleration, okay? And that's, that's it's pretty amazing for a silver stock. Usually silver stocks are, are a lot more choppier than this, but for a silver stock, I was very impressed. And again, we have acceleration, we have persistency, and we have a fairly deep pullback to knock some people out. Also a TKO type of move in there. Now, what you want to do, and, and this is where this gentleman was having trouble, it's like he's having a hard time holding on. Well, if you're following the hybrid money management, remember, as I said earlier, longer term trend following, your drawdowns are going to be abysmal, as will be your accuracy. Now, if you're in the right place at the right time, you'll print money, like a 1999 or again, as I beat the dead horse, not to take anything away from the turtles, but the turtles were in the right place and the right time. And I don't know, I'm sure there's a couple that did well since, but for the most part, it sort of ended badly for the turtles. And their program could have actually blown up about halfway through because they didn't properly adjust for 
the volatility of the market with their leverage and what are their what are the turtles noodled around with with the numbers and stuff it brought it to Eckert and Dennis and said we're risking way too much here we're on the verge of a blow up so they could have blown up during the process but not to take anything away from it what they did was nothing short of miraculous what's interesting there though they all had the same information they all had the same system and some did incredibly well by following the system and others did not, even back in the program when all the commodities were trending back in the day. Anyway, so you wanna follow the hybrid money management system so you get short-term profits, put that in your pocket, and then ride the trend for hopefully, I don't know, I just said hope, but hopefully a long, long time. And it's one way to have your cake and eat it too. So just real quick, we're looking for mostly pullback patterns in nature, so you want a strong trend, you want a correction to where that correction is deep enough to have shaken some people out, but not extremely deep to where it looks like a modified reversal. We use an entry and only get in if and only if the market rallies up to our entry. As I said a thousand times, I've had people criticize my stock picks six months later, and I'll go back and look and like, I don't think I recommended that stock because it's going straight down, but I did recommend it six months ago and it never triggered. So waiting for the entry can keep you out of a lot of trouble. And again, there's a million little things as I've been preaching and waiting for an entry, I think I covered as, as one of those million little things and that in and of itself keep you out of a lot of trouble. So you start putting together this little piece after piece after piece after piece. And before you know it, not overnight, but over time you become successful. So we take profits at the initial profit target. Now, when we're first in a position, for the most part, we kind of stair step that stop higher for the most part. Now, I'm a little bit more lenient in more recent years on that initial trailing stop. But for the most part, it's a one-for-one one basis. So if the stock goes up a point, we bring up the stop. If the stock goes up one point, we bring the stop up one point. And then once we take those partial profits, we bring that stop up to break even. And that's that's the only thing that's done intraday. Everything else is done after the close, okay? Anyway, if the trend continues, then we gradually widen the stop out. So here's where we turn into that longer term trend follower because that's where the real money is. The swing trading is great, don't get me wrong, but I, I now believe over the last 10, 15 years at least, that pure short-term trading, maybe even longer than that, pure short-term trading doesn't really work. And maybe somebody can prove me wrong, but if, you, if you're a pure swing trader, you're still gonna get whacked every now and then because bad things can happen. And you're not getting the full upside of a potential trend that lasts for a couple of years. So just my two cents on that. But have that money management plan in place People ask me, as I've said a thousand times, is my money management plan psychological, statistical? And my answer is yes. You're feeling that, uh, not to go all fresh with psychology on you, but you're kind of lower, you know, Maslow's, uh, what is it, hierarchy of needs, it's like Wi-Fi and then food and shelter, you know, and all the other ones. <laughs> so you're kind of fulfilling that, uh, the shorter term needs by taking the, the profits and we live in this microwave society where we're looking for instant gratification on everything we can't nobody has patience anymore and that short-term profit does that it also taking the short-term profit it also just in case the move the, the bigger picture move does not materialize a lot of times on noise alone you'll make a little money on the trade and if you could make one percent scratch out make one percent scratch out so you're making one percent overall on those or at least on those trades that are hitting the ipt that kind of helps to keep the lights on now your real money is going to be in those longer term trends which sometimes seems like they're few and far between but they do happen and they happen just enough to make it all worthwhile so i don't want to make it sound like it's easy or anything like that now, one thing you have to wrap your head around, George Carlin once said, when you buy a pet, it's gonna be badly. And as I said, a few weeks ago, we had, we were at uh, an emergency vet at 2 a.m. And uh, it's, you know, it ended badly, believe me. And it's 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 a bummer. And it was, it was more of a bummer than I ever realized. I've had dogs my whole life. 
but this dog was really part of a family and i guess being empty nesters she was you know like our uh, third daughter in the house but anyway so my corollary to george carlin is when you make a trade it's going to end badly now technically you could be using some kind of reversion to the mean trade where you get 100 percent out of it or some kind of complex option strategy to where your goal would be a certain amount of money and you can't make any more more money on the position after that and i've used to work years and years ago with the, with a hedge fund that did options and i would sometimes noodle with the spreadsheet on the positions not that i was an option expert but i would noodle with a spreadsheet and i would say you know we we have very little more money we can make on these positions and we have unlimited risk maybe we need to shut down these positions and take you know just be happy with what we have that's a different kind of trading than the trend trading where all the trades eventually end badly and i would say most trades eventually end badly in the end you're going to give up some of those open profits and it's just something that you have to learn how to deal with so i took these winners from earlier and again if you want to know a lot more about these setups go back a couple of weeks in the week of charts i think it was last the end of july but those are the parameters down there and we made 1275 overall now this is something i thought we'd be in for a long long time unfortunately we got stopped out it's better than the poke in the eye but if you're focusing on from that top tick down you actually gave up 1275 on this position but overall you made 1275 dollars okay but if you're focused on what you gave up, which I think this gentleman might be doing a little bit, that's creating some of this animosity or stress in the markets, then it's a lot harder. Now, as I've often said with clients, when they complained about what they gave up in the end, I'd say, I said, well, send me 90% send me of what you made on the entire trade to keep temper, sit out and go get your massage and just try to forget about the trade. Nobody sent me. The money from the trades yet but i'm still waiting all right knf was a 42.91 trade overall from the entry to where we stopped out and that's the ultimate goal you can see we made a thousand the first loaf or 15 percent and then we made 32.91 on the second loaf which was 50 percent and that's where the real money is and yeah, it's one hell of a drawdown in the end. So in the end, we gave up 24.63. Now, I don't have it tonight, but if you go in and look at a lot of positions, especially those ones we held for years, you have these abysmal drawdowns. Maybe that NASDAQ, let's say the Q position goes on, let's say the Q is going to make new highs and well beyond, then that $8,000 mental drawdown, okay, because it's... Uh, or paper drawdown. I mean, it's it's real money, and in your head, it's real money. But technically, when you're following the system, it's still on, and just see what happens. But if you go in and look at the cues, and go in and look at a lot of the positions I get from the archives, you'll see that they had some pretty ugly and abysmal drawdowns in between, especially once you shift gears to that longer-term trend following. Now, you're only on with half of your position size but keep in mind that as that position grows that becomes a bigger and bigger part of your account and the drawdowns become bigger and bigger it comes with the territory it's just something you have to live with it trading's like life it's making decisions and then living with those decisions the making decisions is pretty easy it's living with them that is not i'll have to make a joke about wife's expense on that i'll save it for later so here's the SM, SVM, and you can see overall we made 1,077. That's one of those better than poke the eye trades. We got the IPT, and then we scratched out in the remainder. But if you were to measure that from the high down, and this is one thing I'd recommend you you not do too much of, is watch a screen, especially if you are position trading. Watch a screen if you're doing a little discretion on that, around a stop or around IPT or something. But other than those times, for the most part, just let things unfold and let the chips fall where they may. So again, did you make 1,077? Yes. Did you lose 1,276? Eh, you lost it at open profit, but overall, you still made over 1,000 bucks on a 100K account. So that's better than poking the eye, right?
Now here's the NNE. And we did, we made $5,000 in this trade. So that's 5% on 100K account, right? 127% and change. But and now this one's a big ouch, okay? So this one I'll concede. This one hurt. This one hurt badly. Uh, really bad, I should say, because this, I had this in more than one account. And the smallest position that I had in this was right here, 600. Uh, I think it was, I forget how many shares I had. I have the actual trade somewhere um, in one of these presentations. But anyway, I had at least 600 shares on, and I had, that was the smallest position I had. So I had a lot more in other accounts. And so this one really hurt. Uh, in my defense, it didn't have options that I was trying to, especially the model account, I was trying to follow the system best I could to try to create the same thing that I'm showing you. Uh, in hindsight, I probably should have lightened up a little bit. If this would have had options, I definitely would have lightened up a little bit and I would have frittered away some of that money and bought some crazy out of the money options. Um, I guess I got a little greedy. I probably should have should have uh, backed off a little bit when you have such tremendous gains. I think this was uh, like $3,000 per 100 shares. <laughs> the day I got stopped out of it, the day, the day I didn't take the profit, that night my wife's check engine light goes on in a German car. So it's like, oh boy, <laughs> after just dumping a tremendous amount of money in it. So, um, Next time I will I will lighten up a little bit in, in case that check engine light comes on. Anyway, but yeah, that's the hard part is giving up those open profits, and it's I'm, I'm getting better and better at it. I know that last one was a bad example, and I did get emotional on that one a little bit. But one thing that that I do, and if you have to mentally monetize, I would recommend you mentally, mentally monetize down to the stops. For instance, on the ULS. I think we bumped the stop up 40 cents. So I feel like I made 40 cents today on that position or 40 cents in the right direction. Now, he said he was using mental stops. I would avoid mental stops until you were consistently following the plan. And trading is all about making decisions that again, living with them. And because of the neurology involved with decisions, you want to let the market make as many decisions for you as possible. So let's say you're looking at a stock and you're thinking about getting in at, I don't know, just pull a number out here, 25, okay? Well, the stock's at 24 and it starts to rally a little bit. You're like, you know what? I'm just going to jump in now. I'm not going to wait for the entry, okay? And then if you got in at 25, your plan was to stop out, let's say at 20. Let's say it was a volatile stock, right? An IPO or something. Well, let's say you get in before 25 and then all of a sudden it starts going down. It's like, well, I'm not going to wait for it to go all the way to 20. I'm just going to get out. And before you know it, you could do that two or three times and end up chasing your own tail and really, really stress yourself out as opposed to waiting for that official entry and then putting a hard stop in after that. So let the market stop you into a position. As I've said many times, it's like I'll go to lunch or whatever. I have some resting orders in place and I'll get back from lunch. I'm like, oh, I, have, I now have shares in my account because that decision was made for me. Now, if I was sitting there watching the trade, I might think, oh yeah, this thing doesn't look like it's gonna trigger. I'm gonna go have some lunch. Ah, I'm gonna come back and watch it later. Well, in that case, I might have missed that trade, okay? And that's gonna cause a whole bunch of other problems to occur. So by letting the market stop you into position or stop you out of position. Now, I usually don't put a hard stop in unless it's getting fairly close or unless it dips below that stop level and then I replace that stop after it does a little dip action to try to hold on and use a little discretion. But until you are consistently following the plan, until you trade a small size, until you trade one pattern and get good at it and slowly move up, then these slightly more advanced techniques like discretion where you would allow that stop. Let's say you have an opening gap reversal and you have a good feeling it's gonna bounce back. So instead of selling on that open while everybody's totally panic, you close you close your eyes, you cross your fingers, you keep your eyes open, I guess. And if that stock immediately begins to reverse, you put in a stop right below that low and then let things let things let the chips fall where they may then. But the more the newer you are to trading, the more sort of mechanical 
you want to be, even though this is a discretionary type of system that I that I trade. Now, each decision, as I've talked about quite a bit, comes with stress, and that's neurology, okay? If a decision didn't have a consequence or didn't have stress, then it wouldn't be a decision. Every decision has a consequence. I, You know, my wife was very kind. She's going out with her friends tonight, so she was kind enough to buy me some fried chicken. So it's like I, I, I was you know, starving right before the show. It's like if I had a mal down on that, I didn't do that because I didn't want to be in here all lethargic and blah, 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 you know. <laughs> so that stupid little decision, as I've said before, can impact you quite a bit. So every little decision comes with a lot of stress or a little stress. And, and just think about it. next time you you go to make a decision on something, a doctor's appointment or some other kind of appointment or whether or not you're going to attend a party or not, think about all the stress that comes with that. Think about all the consequences that come with that. And as I've said before, people who have been unfortunate, and, and this uh, research comes from Scholl and Damasio is a lot of the research uh, that I'm spouting out, off here. But according to Scholl and Damasio, people who have had injury or illness, the unfortunate injury or illness to their brains, and it it's damaged that emotional part of their brain that helps them in the decision-making process, they cannot make any decision because one decision does have a consequence over the other. And I think that in life, I mean, for me, this was one of my epiphanies when I saw Denise Scholl talk, I think it was 13 years ago. I'm going back. I know it was 10 years between my speaking appearance and I'm trying to think it was the last time I spoke at uh, in San Francisco for the uh, uh, Technical Analysis Society, TSAA, and that's the San Francisco uh, chapter. Uh, over at Golden Gate. But anyway, uh, she made a really good point about how people that don't have that emotional part of their brain cannot make any decision because nothing has a consequence. So for your homework, what I'd recommend you do is as you make little decisions in life, like, oh, do I stay up and watch the, the finale on this series or do I stay up to three in the morning because somebody's speaking and they're speaking late or do I just go to bed? <laughs> And get a good night's sleep, but oh, I really want to see what's going on, but I also need to sleep because I have to work the next day. So just start being cognizant of all your decisions and realize that in trading, it can be times 10 because you can be a, a bit of a pressure cooker, obviously. You can't kiss all the women. women uh, Bernie alluded to the fact that he was stressing out because stocks were taken off without him. Well, keep in mind that no methodology will guarantee that you capture all moves. So a lot of times I'll see stocks go up and up and up and up and up and never pull back. It's kind of like that TARS, which eventually set up, and then I made a little of a trade, better than poke in the eye, right? But that was something that I really wanted in, and it just kept going up. Now, if you're in a rip-roaring bull market, and we've had a few of these rip-roaring bull markets in the shit coins, SHYT, and all I did was buy the ones that are going up. That's a little bit different type of trading. 99% of what I normally do, though, involves a pullback, and no methodology will guarantee you, you capture all those moves. Now, true, you can buy new highs, and that will give you some sort of guarantee with the buy at B pattern IPOs. It doesn't all but guarantee you're in those setups, but it does help you to get into the setups that take off and keep on taking off, the IPOs that take off and keep on taking off with something like the buy at B, so that, that you are buying as that market's making new highs. In my Landry 200, last I checked, I had one that was up about 270%. I did not personally buy Landry 100. I did not personally buy that stock, but I put it in the list when it was making new highs. My, uh, I should have I should have put the formula in tonight, but basically the formula is just a, a new 52 week closing high. And if I can't find a lot of those or enough of those, I go down a little bit further, maybe to a 90-day closing high, and that's it. With well, a few other caveats, I like the, the volatility to be there. I like the stock to trade fairly cleanly. I like it to be a stock that I'd want to trade anyway, uh, with, again, enough volatility and such. But uh, that's pretty much it, and that's kind of a proof of concept. I've ran this list before, and I started running it again recently. A couple of months ago, I, I, I rebooted it. And that's one of the things that's kind of fun. I know you want to party with me, but it's kind of fun to see these stocks go up and keep going up. Now, 
keep in mind that in order for that kind of thing to work, you either have to be in a fantastic market or have enough stocks to where you'll catch quite a few. Because as you know, breakouts tend to fail. So a lot of these stocks I put in, in this Landry 100 will fail within a few days, but enough other ones after a bit of a correction sometimes, and sometimes they just keep going straight back up. I had one up, uh, like I think like 50% the other day. Now, I wasn't personally long this stock, but at least it was in my momentum list. And the only way you could actually kiss all the women, so to speak, or most of them, would be if you were running something like a momentum list, but that would require a tremendous amount of money to do to trade in such a fashion. Maybe in my next life, I'll run like the Landry 100 or something, and I'll just uh, 10 or 20 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day, whatever it takes, go in and do the research or whatever, and then I'll be off to do whatever else, and I'll let all that just work its way out. But don't try to kiss all the women. And like I said, Via B does do a decent job in IPOs of catching an occasional hot IPO. But Via B in and of itself has a lot of caveats too. Price has to be a certain price. The range has to be a certain, a decent range at least. And there's a few other things. Now I would say just the opposite. You can't kiss all, kiss all the women. Only take highly specialized setups, okay? Something like a Landry Lake pullback, and that's it. And, and start with just one setup there, okay? And again, though, be willing to have a lot of stocks take off without you. Like the TARS or whatever, that thing went up for months, and I was not in it. And it finally set up, and I was able to get in it. Now, the other thing is let the market stop you out of a position okay so so once you're in stick with it and ride the trend for a long time so this guy was worried about his open profits drawdown again okay so he was finding himself getting out of the positions but then how do you get back in you have to wait for the next pullback and like i just said with the tars for instance not to beat the dead horse on that but if it just keeps on going up you may not ever get a chance to get back in and by the time you get a chance to get back in it might be too late i'm re-studying livermore i did a series on jesse livermore and a lot of it came from reminiscence of a stock operator and i forget how many were in the series i, I started the series thinking i'd do it you know four or five weeks or whatever and it went on for like a year uh and and the that's why i'm, I'm going to speak coming up in september on on Jesse Livermore, I'm going to kind of show how it dovetails in what I do, and a lot of the things he says makes a lot of sense. Like he's he's known the market's going to retrace against him, and he knows he's going to lose a lot of money, but he also doesn't want to lose his positions. And one of the things I was reading recently is like some of the guys are like, "Why not just sell out and then buy it back on pullbacks?" It's like, well, that sounds great except that what happens if it just goes up the day after you buy it? You still wait for that pullback and then it goes up and up and up and up. And before you know it, it's doubled or tripled in price and you're still not in. Or worse, it begins to pull back and you think it's a bargain, you get in and that turns out to be the, the end of the road. So it's it's great to have, put yourself in a position where you have a system that you're following, a hybrid money management system, and you're going to stick with those longer term trends and you're going to get out, maybe even at a loss, you know, shorter term. We have losses. We have plenty of losses, right? If I if I went a year without a loss, you'd never see my fast again. It comes with the territory, right? But you do want to make fewer decisions because we all have a little bit different trading psychology based on our makeup. But I'd be willing to bet that we're more more, we have more in common on a psychological level than, than most are willing to believe. The point I'm making here is from a neurological level, we're all pretty much the same, okay? Unless you have an abby normal brain, right? So neurology works a certain way. You need emotions to make decisions. That's that You can't escape that. Now, you might be more emotional than others in your decision making, but no matter what, you can't eliminate your emotion so neurology again is something that you might want to 
explore a little bit when it comes to trading. The thing to realize is markets aren't perfect, okay? And so are you and me. And this is what I was telling to this gentleman. Embrace, but don't try to eliminate your emotions, which I just beat the dead horse on. Accept the imperfect nature of yourself. The markets have a plan and let the chips fall where they may. Recognizing your problems is a huge step towards fixing them, channeling, catering, catering. A problem well stated is a problem half solved. So if you think about trading with technical analysis, and I'm not talking about mumbo jumbo technical analysis, I'm talking about trend following moron stuff, right? Uptrends, pullbacks, pullbacks to the moving average, uh, trend knockout type of pattern, bow ties, all this fairly simple stuff I do. What I'm doing is I'm reading the emotions of the market participants in those two shorts. What happened? Stock went sideways for a while. Anybody who bought in that range, and since the market's dropped below that range, is now looking to get out at break even. I'm not counting of waves and Fibonacci and all this other stuff. I'm just looking at the charts, and I only use for indicators the occasional moving average and something like bow, bow tie proper order and Landry light. Other than that, pretty much no indicators whatsoever. Now, the secret is reading the emotions of the market participants is fairly easy until, of course, you have a position on, right? Then you have a bias. So the hard part is embracing your own emotion. And you have to embrace again and not eliminate. Now, Yogi Berra once said if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. And that's the reason technical analysis works, because the market participants often behave in an irrational manner. So you want to recognize and acknowledge that all decisions are emotionally based. If you could channel catering or catering, you know what you're doing wrong. You know what you're doing wrong. And that's after you have a little bit of experience like this gentleman here. He basically told me everything he was doing wrong. And it's kind of like the doctor, doctor joke, which I think I have a slide in here. Don't do that. Live more again. You get so much good out of him. A stock speculator makes mistakes and knows that he is making them. And in Trading Full Circle, I talked about all these different things where people tell me what's going on. And I'll say, you know, whenever I work with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, I'm like, how the hell am I going to fix this guy or gal? And then I'm going to figure out what they're doing wrong. And it's like, I just ask them. I'm not honoring my stops. I'm taking profits too soon. Like this guy, uh, Bernie, he's taking profits too soon, right? And then he's looking to try to get back in. He's trying to be all things in all markets as opposed to just letting things unfold, okay? But anyway, I get tons and tons of confessions when I ask what people are doing wrong. And my favorite, of course, is when somebody emailed me and said, you know the passage from Paul, I know not to do, but I keep doing it. And I looked it up, Romans 7, 19, I wanna do what is good, but I don't, I don't wanna do what is wrong, but I do it anyway, amen. Kind of like the cat in the hat. There's a, there's a little, there's a little voice. Yeah, from my shoulder saying, don't do it, but there's a bigger voice saying, do it, or something like that. Anyway, like the old doctor and doctor joke, the nurse want to do this, the solution is simple, don't do that. The altcoins aren't doing so hot, and Bitcoin, for that matter, is still not doing so hot. You can see we're kind of sideways at best. If you're confused about a market, draw a horizontal line, okay, from today's close going back in time. And you can see we can go all the way back to when? March, okay? I call this a Rip Van Winkle sleep test, February, actually. So let's say in the February, you went on a vacation for a few months, and Bitcoin was about 60000 okay? And then you just get back from vacation today, you check a newspaper or whatever, and if they still exist, and you see that Bitcoin, oh, Bitcoin didn't do anything. It's still at 60000 okay? That's the first thing you need to do in any market is see how far, how long it's been going sideways, if it has been going sideways. The 30 EMA, as I preached, is a good a good little indicator. I know I said I don't use a lot of indicators, but I do like the 30 EMA, especially the Landry light. The highs, great, uh, highs less than the moving average for downtrends or greater than the moving average for uptrends. 
and you can see like way back here we had tons and tons of landry light in fact we got time let's just punch that up over here so you can see that so something simple simple like landry light and bow tie proper order see here's the piece okay spiders but that'll work so you can see we had like 100 days of almost 100 days of upside landry light lows are greater than the moving average now it doesn't always work out so great but you can see when the trend when a market trends that could be quite nicely it could work behave quite nicely something that simple the Qs had a pretty good run okay there's a landry light pullback right there that's that's kind of a textbook setup there and you can see we had some downside landry light now we get a little upside landry light yeah the market's getting a little questionable we'll get to that in just one second but anyway paying attention to that oh i want to show you bitcoin that's what i want to do so take a look at bitcoin we're kind of getting a little choppy in here again rip van winkle test sideways you can see we haven't made a whole lot of progress in a long time and we've had some upside landry light here and there upside landry light back here market gets a little questionable a little choppy you get a little red a little green flipping back and forth that's a choppy market you want to avoid it and then you get nice green again it's something that you might want to think about figuring out how to get in in this trend here but right now we're kind of in this chop mode if anything i would be slightly bearish for now on bitcoin it still looks toppy but if we could get through all of this fluff, anybody who's bought since March, okay? If we could get through all that trading and start banging out some new highs, then obviously I would start getting excited again. Take a look at Ethereum. You can see lots of land your life to the downside there. In fact, we'll punch it up in over here. So with Ethereum and especially Bitcoin not doing so great, the rest of the altcoins tend to follow suit. So those are your bellwethers, especially Bitcoin. But you can see we had 23 days of downside Landry light in Ethereum. Now, as I often preach, as a general rule, never buy a market that's trading below its 30 EMA. So let's go back here. We're about, let's just say 3,300 round numbers. And now we're at 2600. So what's that? What's 3300 minus? 20? So that's about a 21% drop, which is substantial for something like Ethereum or anything for that matter, right? But for Ethereum, it's a pretty big deal. But if you look at these shit coins and just pay attention to that 30 EMA. And I show this every week, but you kind of get the idea. Let me just find a couple of great examples. I mean, you can see all these ones just that have been in the toilet for so long. Here's a great example. GNO. You guys know what they do? I have no idea. But you can see, look, below the 30. I mean, it peaked up right here, but I wouldn't get too excited about that because it trends down. But let's just go to the last time it touched the 30. 280 down to 165. It dropped all the way down to 128. So that it lost over half of its value. And guess what? No capital gets put into hard, harm's way by not buying any market that's not trading above the 30 EMA, okay? Write that down. No capital goes into harm's way by trading markets, by not trading markets below 30 EMA. So again, as I often say, sometimes when crypto is blowing and going, you can just come in here and buy the top the hottest altcoins provided they're banging out new highs with a bit of vigor i haven't seen that type of market lately i have not been doing my homework as much as i should i have been looking at crypto bubble.net crypto bubbles.net and that's kind of a cool thing to look at now you can see lots of green tonight so that's a good thing lately this has been mostly red so there's just not a lot to get excited about but as I preach, and that was one of the million little things, I do need to be doing my homework in crypto. And I've, I've because I don't see anything possibly happening there anytime soon, I still need to pay attention and do my homework. All right, let's shift gears and go to stocks. 
And if you guys have any stock stocks you want me to look at, I'll be happy to do that now. Let me just change my uh, application over. All right, let's take a look at the P's, S&P 500. Okay, now forever, I've been warning that these V-shaped recoveries at high levels are very hard to sustain. It's one of my least favorite patterns because when a market becomes this overbought, this fast, it really becomes a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. If you buy it, the market corrects. If you don't buy it, overbought becomes even more overbought. So I just don't like going into a market like this. And today you've kind of got your reason. Now the market didn't really come unglued. It was down eh, a little bit less than 1%. But if you look at where we started, where we ended up, that's a substantial move. And that's the last of the fake out there, okay? And that's something I've been asked about on YouTube recently and some other places. And you have to think in terms of what will cause the most pain and the most amount of people, because that's what the market will often do. And in this particular case, the most pain would be for this market to go straight back up and then begin to roll over and, and sort of punish those people that hung on. Now, here's what I'm hoping, and you should never hope in markets, but here's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that we stabilize somewhere around these levels, maybe chop around sideways for a little while, let the markets readjust to this new level, let everything, let the overbought condition be walked off, so to speak, and then we make a new leg higher. But, I'm going to take things one day at a time. NASDAQ, not nearly as impressive as the P's as far as getting NASDAQ. Uh, P's are within 1% of their all-time highs before today, obviously. NASDAQ got whacked pretty hard today, as you can see. And this actually puts it back below the 50. Nothing magical about that, but it, it can give you a good reference. I only pay attention to the 50 and the 200 when the market gets a little questionable. But anyway, I wouldn't get too excited about these bow ties flipping back to uptrend proper order, which I probably will do over the few, next few days. I'd be more concerned about this outside day down we had today. Now, again, if we just chop around here within a thousand points or so, whatever, that sounds crazy, huh? A thousand points, that's ridiculous. Then we might just be okay. We can, again, walk off this overbought condition. My big concern, though, again, is these V shaped recoveries at high levels, like just randomly pick this one but cybersecurity okay you can see it gaps to all-time highs and then starts to come in so and it was just selling off not that long ago so this market is severely overbought very dangerous market to buy into efa shares had that v-shaped recovery you can see they're stalling out the prior highs i'm not calling a top in all these markets i'm just saying pay attention okay don't rush out and buy them Maybe short a little bit, but pick your spots really carefully, such as those two mystery charts. That would be a good place to start, in my humble opinion. Rusty stalled out. Rusty had a big sell-off, and it's stalling short, well short of its prior highs in here. So Rusty's still questionable at best. Gold, the commodity, has been doing pretty good today, notwithstanding. My only concern here is that we're pulling back into where we recently broke out from. If we drop much further. I'd be concerned about that. Gold stocks are okay, but you do have a minor double top there. I'm not seeing any setups here just yet. Maybe if we get some upside follow through, we'll start to see something happen there. Software, another one of these poster childs for these V-shaped recoveries. And again, it's not the end of the world. I'm not making some prognostication. I'm just telling you what I know is that this market is very overbought and it's very hard to sustain such whatever you want to call it. Trees don't grow to, grow, to the, grow to the sky. Very hard to maintain that momentum. Defense stocks have come back sharply. That's kind of a V-shaped recovery, but they haven't really gotten past that prior little peak in here. So we'll have to pay attention to that situation. Banks, none of those areas retracing after recent slide. The mags, so, so the mags were your previous leaders, right? They were just kind of going up day after day after day. Then they began to implode, and now you have a bit of what I call a witch's hat. It looks like a witch hat, upside down witch hat, to where the market stalls out right at the prior little peak. This was almost textbook in nature, and it got spanked today over 2.5%, down over 2.5%.
So we'll have to pay attention. And, and whatever happens, happens. Okay, I'm a trend follower. Let's see what happens. Right now, this looks like a market that has ran out of gas, run out of gas, has run out of gas, and looks like it could be in early phases of rolling over, make a new leg higher. Biotechnology has been doing pretty good. Banged out all-time highs today before coming back in. Another one of these areas that's kind of overbought, not nearly as overbought as many others, but overbought nonetheless. Let's take a look at major drugs. They close at all-time highs, so these guys are looking pretty darn good. And we don't have that V-shaped recovery here. We have a bit of a base. So if we could base around in these other sectors, that would be phenomenal and make new highs. Believe me, it's much easier to trade a bull market than a bear market, but I'm ready for both. Semiconductor is getting back to the downside. Kind of looks like the mags. I mean, they got spanked today, down 3% and change. I couldn't help myself. I had to uh, play the uh, Sox S throughout the day on the, on the short side, short semis, long Sox S. Anyway, you can see a tiny bit of an opening lap, I guess, or maybe a tiny gap there before imploding. And this is your, again, your V-shaped recovery problem that happens. Let's take a look at a few more areas. Uranium, the commodity, not doing so hot. Longer term downtrend so far, pulling back, beginning to sell off out of that pullback. Dollar's been pretty weak as of late, so that'll eventually start to help commodities a little bit because commodities are dollar denominated. Energies have been chopping their way lower for the most part, but there's nothing to trade here because they're so darn choppy. Back to the upside, utilities making new highs. Kind of hard to get excited about utilities, but We'll see. I know there was a lot of excitement about utilities being kind of like an AI play, so a different little spin on things. So we'll see how that shakes out. But for now, there's nothing there for me. Metals and mining overall, they're wide and loose as they normally are, but you can see so far, we're beginning to sell off out of a retrace. All right, any stocks you guys want me to look at? I know once we started Facebook, then that kind of evaporated for the people in Facebook. But anybody not in Facebook or anything that uh, we haven't gotten around to covering? You want me to take a look at? I know there's not a lot out there because of the, the way the market is, but there's shorts. There's, there's a lot of shorts that are showing up. And here's the thing, you know, you start getting bearish, all of a sudden everybody hates you, but I'm not saying I'm bearish yet. I'm cautious and I'm willing to put on some shorts in the meantime. I would prefer if these shorts didn't trigger and the market just goes straight up. That would be, that would be an ideal scenario for me, much easier to trade again. But you have to be willing to let the chips fall where they may. All right, any uh, going once, going twice? I'll give my YouTube brethren a, a, a chance to catch up. They're about a minute behind. All right, while we're in an impasse, obviously I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, Dave at DaveLandry.com. I think everybody in the GoToWebinar is in Facebook, so I'll see all you guys and girls tomorrow. Everybody else? Those uh, my brethren over there on YouTube, I'll see you hopefully next week. Everybody have a great week and may the trend be with you. Thank you so much.